Well, thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, and thank you so much for the invitation. Um, too bad we can't be in person today, but alas, such is the weather. <laughs> um, yes, so as was noted, um, I'll go ahead and just share my screen here before I get started. And... Okay, folks can see okay? Yeah, that works well. Okay, wonderful. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'll be presenting on my work looking at um, Green, mostly greenhouse gas fluxes from wetlands and thinking about um, both current and future wetland emissions uh, and sort of their role in climate change mitigation and adaptation. Okay, so before I go ahead and get started, I just wanted to uh, thank my lab for all their wonderful work. Most of the work that I'll be presenting today uh, was completed by um, graduate students and undergraduate students in my research group uh, over the past almost four years since I've been here. Um, so I do, I quite like this quote, uh, and I like to open um, by acknowledging all the great work that they do. Okay, <clears throat> um, so thinking about wetlands, uh, wetlands are diverse ecosystems, they incorporate uh, swamps, marshes, and other open, um, open water uh, or saturated lands. Uh, we know that they provide many ecosystem services, and so among the many ecosystem services that they provide, so including ranging from wildlife habitat to water quality improvements. Uh, climate regulation is identified as one of their most important benefits to society. So here we're just looking at uh, carbon fluxes uh, in and out of wetland ecosystems. So wetlands play an important role in the climate system. So they provide the ideal environment for carbon sequestration uh, and the long-term storage of atmospheric CO2. Uh, despite only covering about 5 to 8% of Earth's land surface, they hold as much as 30% uh, of the global soil carbon, and so they're among the most carbon-rich uh, sinks on our planet. But the same anaerobic conditions that are favorable for carbon sequestration are also those that create methane. So here is looking at the global methane budget from 2008 to 2017, and I won't go necessarily into all the different sources and sinks, but suffice to say that uh, wetlands are the largest single source of atmospheric methane, so they contribute as much. And we can see that there's a range here, so sort of in between 25 to 40% of all total methane emissions. And so this is a range showing the difference between bottom-up estimates from biogeochemical models and top-down estimates uh, from inversions. Um, so despite being large sources, there's again, a lot of uncertainty associated with, with wetland methane emissions. Um, <clears throat> furthermore, climate change has the potential to increase greenhouse gas emissions from wetlands, so through changes in temperature, hydrology, and vegetation. Um, but the impacts of a changing climate on wetland greenhouse gas fluxes remain uncertain. So uh, in addition to their uh, response to climate change and possible feedbacks there, um, human activities, such as wetland drainage, can also significantly impact carbon fluxes or carbon stocks, resulting in large greenhouse gas emissions, particularly of carbon dioxide. So this is just a map showing CO2 emissions from degraded peatlands. Um, and in fact, uh, it's estimated that the drainage of peatlands across the world uh, emits over a pedogram of CO2 per year, which is roughly about a fifth of all um, land use uh, and land cover change emissions. So if we think about what is the role of wetlands in the climate system and how can they help with uh, climate change mitigation, uh, here I'm just showing some of the top 10 um, natural climate solutions. So that's the conservation um, or the management or restoration of ecosystems to help sequester carbon and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So here we're highlighting the top 10 mitigation pathways and it's represented just in in metrics of um, you know, millions of tons of cars. So you, know, you often uh, probably have heard about you know, the importance of uh, reforestation or avoided forest conversion or forest management. Um, but in here, we also see the important role of wetlands. Um, so what I'll be touching on today is thinking about avoided peatland impacts. So continuing you know, to preserve these peatlands, thinking about the role of peatland restoration. And I'll give an example here in our backyard from our work at Burns Bog. Um, and then also thinking about both the restoration of coastal wetlands and also avoided coastal wetland impacts. Uh, and again, drawing on some examples locally uh, and then some examples in uh, um, the US as well. 
So thinking about the role of wetlands, um, I'll be presenting some of our work looking at the impacts of wetland restoration on greenhouse gas fluxes. Um, I'll discuss a little bit more the role of coastal wetlands in climate change mitigation and adaptation. Uh, and then also I'll present uh, one study focused on leveraging the FlexNet methane database, which is a global eddy covariance methane database uh, to help us answer regional and global questions related to methane cycling in wetlands. And so this is a project that I've been involved in over the last several years on working to compile this database. So first, uh, I'll focus on looking at the impacts of wetland restoration on greenhouse gas fluxes. Um, so this work is being done at Burns Bog, uh, so quite close to where we are here. Um, Burns Bog, uh, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, was uh, is uh, a peatland ecosystem. So it was significantly disturbed as a result of drainage for peat mining, urban development, and agriculture. So in 2005, the Burns Bog Ecological Conservancy uh, Area was established to help conserve Burns Bog. And starting in 2007, there was restoration projects. So this was done by a large scale ditch blocking program uh, to help raise water tables. Um, and so there's been various parts of the bog that have been actively rewetted through, you know, uh, blocking different drainage ditches. And so we have a number of, uh, <clears throat> we have two field sites currently in Burns Bog. Uh, so our first field site, this is uh, an actively rewetted part of the peatland. And there was an eddy covariance tower that was actually set up before I started um, in 2014. Uh, and then we also set up a second eddy covariance tower. Um, and this site differs somewhat, and we'll talk about the two differences between these two, but it uh, differs in terms of its restoration history. So there was more sort of passive restoration that uh, gone on here, less sort of active ditch blocking to raise the water table. Uh, and so we were interested in looking at how do different management activities uh, and how in turn, how, you know, that's gonna affect species composition, uh, and other sort of biophysical properties like water table and surface roughness. Um, how does that impact carbon cycling between these two different sites in Burns Bog? So both restored peatlands, but that look a little bit different. So again, we were interested in quantifying greenhouse gas fluxes uh, in our heterogeneous uh, restored peatland site. So our first site is this actively restored site. Um, it was rewetted using a number, again, blocking drainage ditches. I've heard that sometimes they'll even use election signs to help block the ditches and keep the water from flowing. So I guess a good use of recycling election signs. Uh, but this is dominated by uh, sedges and sphagnum, and it's much wetter than our second site here. This is a passively restored site. Uh, it's made up mostly of scrub pines, sphagnum, and low shrubs with a lower water table depth. Um, and this starts to resemble, this uh, uh, ecosystem starts to resemble a little bit more what the peatland would have looked like uh, in its more natural setting. And so one of the key differences between these two sites is that there's large differences in water table height. So this is water table depth below means below the surface, negative means below the surface. Um, and the difference between our passive site being much drier and our active site being quite wet. Um, and as you would imagine, that is going to play an important role when we think about biogeochemical cycling and greenhouse gas fluxes from these wetlands. So we conducted year-round eddy covariance measurements, and I'll be presenting data for one year. Um, and for those that are less familiar with eddy covariance measurements, um, although I know <clears throat> this is becoming more and more standard these days, but um, we can measure the direct flux of carbon dioxide, methane, water, and energy between the surface and the, and the atmosphere by measuring turbulent fluctuations in vertical wind uh, and concentrations of our gases of interest, so CO2 uh, and uh, carbon dioxide. So I like to think of eddy covariance as sort of measuring the breathing of our atmosphere. So this is just showing what some of this data looks like. So this wasn't actually Burns Bog. This is an animation from another site. But again, it allows us to make continuous ecosystem scale greenhouse gas measurements. Let me go ahead. Okay, so uh, I wanna talk a little bit about what happens, how do these two different types of restoration impact carbon dioxide fluxes at the bog? And then we'll think about methane uh, and bring that together for the full greenhouse gas budget, but first focusing on net CO2 exchange. So here we have a plot showing 
cumulative net ecosystem exchange. So this is just summing up all of our you know, half hour measurements over the entire year. So here we're starting in January, this is for 2019, going all the way to January of the following year. So we can see in the non-growing season that it tends to be a source of CO2 to the atmosphere. During the growing season, we're taking up carbon dioxide, both sites. But then by the end of the year, we can see that the wetter of the two sites was actually a net carbon sink. So negative numbers mean a net carbon sink from the atmosphere. Uh, and the drier of the site, the passively restored one, was uh, roughly carbon neutral. If you add the uncertainty estimates were right around zero. Uh, <clears throat> so you know why, why the difference between the two? So we can partition our net ecosystem exchange into photosynthesis and respiration. So if we focus first on photosynthesis, so again, this is looking at cumulative photosynthesis or GPP over the course of the year. And we could see that the passive site, the one that has more um, shrubs and um, some trees is a slightly larger, has slightly higher photosynthesis over the course of the year. Whereas our actively restored site, this one here, uh, tends to have slightly lower photosynthesis. But one of the key difference here is that our drier site, um, this passively restored site has much higher rates of ecosystem respiration. Uh, and that's because we have lower water tables. And when we have more aerobic conditions, we can enhance rates of ecosystem respiration. So these two canceled each other out, meaning that our passively restored site was roughly carbon neutral. Uh, if we look at our active sites, again, although it had lower rates of photosynthesis, it also had lower rates of respiration. And so here, photosynthesis exceeded respiration making this site um, a net carbon sink. Um, so just sort of recapping, we can see that our wetter site was a greater carbon sink. Our drier site was roughly carbon neutral. So that was thinking about carbon dioxide. What about methane? Um, as we would expect, I guess not too surprisingly, the wetter site or the actively restored site was a larger source of methane, so being wetter, greater anaerobic conditions, uh, leading to larger methane emissions over the year, whereas the drier site had slightly lower methane emissions. So we can think about putting these two together, so comparing or bringing together the CO2 and the methane budget in terms of CO2 equivalent. So this is showing uh, these number down here is looking at the 100 year uh, radiative balance, so in grams of CO2 equivalent per meter squared per year, using a sustained global warming potential of methane of 45. But regardless of what time scale we're looking at, um, the, both sites were net greenhouse gas sources across these different time scales. Um, we can see that the active site on this 100 time year time scale being slightly larger because of the methane, um, <clears throat> but uh, both sites being uh, net greenhouse gas sources. Um, but of course, this type of analysis is you know, somewhat simplistic, applying these global warming potentials or sustained global warming potentials don't really tell sort of the whole story. Uh, another thing to consider is, even though they might be greenhouse gas sources, what would happen if we left the peatland unrestored? What happened if we don't rewet the peatland? We know that, restore, that we know that drain peatlands can be large sources of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. So how does rewetting compare to what would have happened if we just uh, you know, sort of left burned fog, um, drained, unattended, and potentially releasing CO2. So we did a little bit of uh, radiative forcing modeling. Um, so again, to address some of the, the some of the limitations associated with using this uh, radiative forcing approach, uh, this global warming approach, we did a little bit of modeling here. And so this is showing radiative forcing, so in um, nanowatts per meter squared, over time, so this is when restoration would have occurred. And one thing that we can see, so this is looking at the radiative forcing of a drained and unrestored version of Burns Bog. So uh, here we're using uh, IPCC tier one emission factors. So we can see that if we were to leave it unrestored, that it would be, um, it would have much larger radiative forcing relative to any sort of rewetting that has undergone. So even though both the active and the passive site have a positive radiative forcing, there is still a climate benefit, right? This area here is sort of the climate benefit to restoration. Uh, another thing that we can see here is that over longer time scales, that the actively restored site, the one with higher methane emissions, actually over time has lower radiative forcing 
than the passively restored site. And this is because although methane is a potent greenhouse gas, it has a much shorter atmospheric lifetime. So at these longer time scales, um, <clears throat> we can see that the active site has lower radiative forcing. And if you draw this out into the very long-term time scale, so on the order of about 3000 years post-restoration, it actually converts from um, having a positive to a negative radiative forcing. So having a cooling impact on the climate. So I think this just sort of highlights both, um, you know, the importance of considering, you know, drained versus restored, and also thinking about the, the timescales involved with these types of uh, restoration projects. Um, so just to bring these two components together, so here, looking at uh, greenhouse gas budgets and radiative forcing. So we can see that our, act, our actively restored site, our wetter site was a greater carbon sink. Uh, it had lower radiative forcing over long time scales uh, and even negative radiative forcing on very long time scales. Whereas our actively or our passively restored site uh, was a slight carbon source or carbon neutral. And it also had higher radiative forcing over longer time scales. But overall, restoration has a positive climate benefit if we compare it to um, no management action and you know, keeping these sites drained. Okay, so that was thinking about what are the biogeochemical implications of wetland restoration. Uh, another thing that's important to think about is what are the biophysical impacts of restoration. So looking at you know, what are the differences in energy partitioning and surface roughness between the different sites? How does that impact both surface and boundary layer uh, air temperatures? So there's fewer studies that tend to look at some of these biophysical effects of restoration. Um, you know, they can either attenuate or enhance some of these biogeochemical uh, effects at uh, local to regional scales. And so we were interested in looking at what is the difference in surface temperature um, or, you know, mixed layer temperature between these two sites uh, and how does that relate to the surface roughness and the partitioning of sensible and latent heat between these two sites. Um, and so one of the key differences between the two sites, so in addition to the passive site being drier than the active site, uh, it's also rougher. It has a taller, slightly taller canopy than our active site. Um, and so uh, there's, you know, differences in partitioning of sensible and latent heat between the two sites. Uh, and so again, as I mentioned, you know, we were interested in looking at differences in temperature to look at these biophysical impacts on wetland restoration. So in our case here, um, I'll just show one figure. This is looking at mean monthly aerodynamic temperature. So we were interested in using aerodynamic temperature since that's the temperature um, of the surface that drives our turbulent flexes. But the same thing, uh, you know, for looking at air temperature, we get similar results. But one of the, another key difference between the two sites is that the wetter site, the actively restored site is actually a little bit warmer than our passively restored site. Um, and so on average over the year, the wetter of the two sites was about one degree Celsius warmer than uh, the drier or passively restored site. Um, and this is largely due to the fact that daytime temperatures tend to be similar between the two sites um, for a variety of different reasons. And I can get into that if folks have questions, um, but the storage of heat in the water column at our wetter actively restored site um, you know, was releasing heat and causing it to be much warmer at night leading to greater monthly temperatures and um, uh, annual temperatures overall. So if we bring these two pieces of the puzzle together, um, looking at both the biogeochemical and biophysical impacts of restoration, we can see that our actively restored site is a greater carbon sink. Uh, it has lower radiative forcing, particularly over long scales, um, but is slightly warmer. Whereas our passively restored site is carbon neutral. It has slightly higher radiative forcing, um, but slightly cooler temperatures. So these are sort of competing factors. And so some of the work that we're continuing to do is to sort of reconcile these two things. Um, and then also think about, you know, what are some of the optimal conditions or restoration strategies for both maximizing carbon sequestration um, and biophysical benefits while also minimizing greenhouse gas emissions. So this is some ongoing work that we have 
Obviously what I presented was just one year of measurements. We know that these systems have a lot of interannual variability. And so we're continuing to make these measurements over longer time periods to be able to see, you know, how does this vary from year to year and do these patterns that we observed, you know, at a single year hold um, over multiple years. So I think there's, you know, some exciting work to do here and, uh, you know, more work to be done at Burns Bog. We're working closely with Metro Vancouver who are also very interested in some of these results. Um, and we're continuing to, you know, uh, collaborate with them on some additional research across the bog. Okay, so that was thinking about uh, the role of peatlands. So in particular, you know, focusing on avoiding uh, peatland or uh, restoring peatlands. The next part that I'll be talking about today is thinking about the role of coastal wetlands in climate change mitigation and adaptation. So you know, slightly lower benefits, but they still make the top 10 uh, natural climate solutions. And so why are folks interested in blue carbon ecosystems? So blue carbon incorporates tidal marshes, mangroves, and seagrasses. Uh, and so there's been a lot of interest recently on blue carbon in terms of both climate change mitigation and adaptation. Uh, and that's because blue carbon ecosystems, and I'm particularly gonna focus on tidal marshes here, they can be effective carbon sinks, so they can store a lot of carbon per unit area. Um, but unlike freshwater marshes, their methane fluxes tend to be much lower. So as salinity increases, we can see that there is a dramatic drop in methane fluxes. Uh, and this is due to the presence of sulfate, um, you know, outcompeting methanogens and really dropping methane fluxes. And so unlike freshwater wetlands, uh, blue carbon ecosystems like tidal marshes are strong carbon sinks, but they don't have the byproduct of releasing methane or as much methane. And so this is some work that I did when I did a postdoc with the USGS. So some research in California. So this is San Francisco over here. Our tower here is uh, the Rush Ranch Tower in Sassoon Marsh. Uh, so the, the tower, uh, this is our, our eddy covariance site right at the edge of the marsh here and we're making measurements directly over the marsh. And we were able to make measurements over a number of different years. And here we can look um, at our annual sums of net ecosystem exchange, our annual methane budgets and our net greenhouse gas budget. Um, and so we can see that in most years that the site is a strong carbon sink from the atmosphere. Methane fluxes are really low uh, across all the different years. And so if we look at the net greenhouse gas budget, we can see that it's a net greenhouse gas sink on most of the years. Um, obviously we see some interannual variability as we would expect. Um, and I'll get into that in a second, but here if we look, you know, sort of at the net greenhouse gas budget, and I was just sort of doing a back of the envelope calculation, you know, assuming this is sort of a typical marsh and we take a, a rough estimate of um, tidal marshes across the globe, we can see that scale globally, this is equivalent to sequestering about 90 million tons of CO2 equivalent per year. Um, and that's comparable to the emissions from about 20 million cars per year. So obviously, you know, being able to preserve these ecosystems is important. If we were to drain them, that would release a lot of CO2 back to the atmosphere. Um, but as I noted, you know, there is significant interannual variability between the years. Uh, and this is something that one of my master's students had a chance to look on for her dissertation. And she was interested in understanding, you know, what are the drivers of this interannual variability in carbon fluxes, um, you know, particularly as we think about climate change uh, and how are these systems going to response respond to changing environments. And so here uh, we have plots of our cumulative net ecosystem exchange across a couple different years. Uh, I think I have another figure showing the legends, but we can see that there's a lot of variability in the net carbon budget over these different years. So some, you know, most years being net carbon sinks, one year being a slight uh, source. So again, this is the legend showing the years. And so we were interested in understanding, well, is this due to changes in respiration or photosynthesis between the years? And what we found was that most of this variation in our net ecosystem exchange was driven by variations in photosynthesis across the different years uh, and respiration was much more similar between all the different years. 
And so we looked at, you know, what are some of the driving causes or potential factors that are influencing it? Is it temperature? Um, you know, uh, the differences in radiation? Is it differences uh, in water table height? Is it differences in salinity? So one thing to note here was that over this period, uh, California experienced a pretty pronounced drought. And a drought for this tidal marsh doesn't mean that there wasn't, you know, um, sufficiently high water levels. Water levels remained roughly similar, but what changed was the difference in uh, uh, the type of water that was on the marsh. So during drier years, we had more input of salt water from the San Francisco Bay up into the marsh, whereas during wet years, we had more inputs of fresh water from river discharge. And so one of the factors that varied quite strongly over this period was salinity. And so uh, we can see that you know, salinity was uh, the strongest driver of photosynthesis between these different years. Obviously, uh, this is, you know, we only have five points and we don't see a significant relationship when we look at sort of this simple correlation. Um, but we also ran some linear models and we played around with some random forest modeling to really show that it was actually this high salinity that reduced marsh productivity over these different years. And so you can imagine with you know, future droughts or rising sea levels that this can have an impact on the carbon budget of these ecosystems. Sorry, Sarah, just letting you know there's four minutes left. Great, thanks. Um, and so we're also thinking about blue carbon here in BC. So these are our Burns Bog sites. Um, we've recently set up two towers. So one in a salt marsh in um, Delta over here in Boundary Bay and a second in Richmond. So if you're walking along the dike over here, you can actually see our tower from the dike. And we're interested in similar questions. Um, our differences in salinity between these two sites can mean differences in methane. Um, so some of our preliminary findings showing that our salt marsh uh, has very, very little methane, but uh, is an effective carbon sink. So making it overall a net greenhouse gas sink. Whereas our brackish site is a stronger carbon sink, but it has more methane. And we don't have a full year yet, so we can't um, you know, really give you an annual budget, but we are working towards this. And I think this is some really nice work. Um, and also, you know, there's some growing interests across BC uh, looking at sort of incorporating this into climate policy. Um, and there's sort of a broader interest across Canada in terms of uh, understanding uh, these blue carbon ecosystems. Okay, so in the last three minutes, um, I'll go ahead and just talk a little bit about um, some work that we've been doing using eddy covariance towers across the globe to upscale methane fluxes from wetlands at a global scale. And so this is some work that we started in 2017, 2018, bringing together global data sets of eddy covariance across the globe. Um, and so we published the first uh, community product for those that might be familiar with FluxNet that the global uh, database of eddy covariance data. And up until this, it didn't include any methane. Um, so we brought all of this together and then we leveraged this data to answer you know, some exciting questions looking at methane fluxes from wetlands across different scales. Um, and so I'll just present one example of some of the work that we've been doing, but we've been leveraging this data set to answer and look at um, a whole range of other questions as well. But I just wanted to show some of the work that we've been doing using this data set to upscale methane fluxes. So to, to develop a data-driven methane, wetland methane emissions product um, over this time period here. And so we use a random forest model and we use our sites uh, across the globe. Again, there's a lack of measurements here and we'll see that you know, that's also uh, an important data gap, um, but we see relatively good um, you know, model performance. And so we were able based on our tower data um, and our model that's you know, driven with globally gridded products, um, we are able to upscale this globally here. So this is just showing, again, methane fluxes at the global scale based on this random forest model using uh, developed using our flux tower data. And we sort of pick up some of the key hotspots. Um, but of course, there is quite a bit of uncertainty. Some of the biggest uncertainty, not surprisingly based on the lack of measurements, is here in the tropics. Um, but if we look sort of at the different wetland products, so this is our, our um, model, uh, our random forest model, our, our gridded data-driven model compared to inversion models, top-down approaches, and wetland uh, biogeochemical models, we can see that at the global scale that they tend to agree, you know, pretty well. Um, our estimates agree quite well with the bottom up. 
um, but it breaks down and you know better at high latitudes, but it sort of breaks down in these tropical areas. So we tend to be underestimating methane fluxes from humid tropical regions and overestimating them in semi-arid regions. Okay, so I think I'll be able to end here on time, um, but just sort of recapping, you know, thinking about the role of wetlands in a changing world. Um, if we think about the impacts, in our case, peatland restoration, uh, we show that, you know, restored wetlands could be greenhouse gas sources, but um, that these greenhouse gas emissions are lower than if we left them, you know, if we left them drained and unrestored. So restoration does have a climate benefit. Uh, in terms of coastal wetlands, blue carbon ecosystems are generally strong carbon sinks um, and greenhouse gas sinks, uh, but that there is a lot of interannual variability. And leveraging this global data set of eddy covariance methane measurements, we're uh, able to generate a data-driven map, uh, a global map of wetland methane emissions, but of course, this needs to, to be refined and more observations are needed across the globe, but particularly in the tropics. And so we have a follow-up grant with some colleagues across the US. Um, we're really gonna be focusing on methane emissions from tropical wetlands. So I'm, I'm excited to continue to work on this. Uh, and then of course, I just wanna you know, thank all my different collaborators, um, in addition to all the students who have done you know, most of this hard work. And with that, I would be happy to take any questions. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. That was fabulous. Um, I think it's probably easiest if you field your own questions, just uh, if people who aren't students can hold back for the first two questions and then, and we'll also try and monitor the chat. Sounds great. Um, I can't, oh, okay. I can't see yes. everyone now. <laughs> Um, just looking for hands, they should. So if you do, this, yeah, feel free to un <laughs> unmute yourself or. Yeah, let me see what I can see. Now there's that Zoom pause. Questions then from anyone in the audience since no students are poking their hands up. Okay, well, I'm gonna break the ice then. Oh, uh, Chris, Chris has one. There. Okay, Chris. Uh, thanks for that wonderful talk, Sarah. Uh, I'd, I'd love to grab uh, coffee with you at some point, but a uh, question I can ask you now, and, and I'm not sure if you had any equipment out uh, soon enough to catch the big heat dome last June. I was wondering if there were any impacts of that, and if so, were they transient or, or did they last uh, longer? Uh, yeah, great question. So yeah, we had our field sites uh, in Burns Bog, and we had one in Delta at the salt marsh in Delta. And that's something that we're just starting to look at a little bit more now. So I have an undergraduate student who's starting to look at some of that data. Um, I can definitely say that, you know, the, the heat dome that we experienced, um, uh, well, we we're looking at 2021 data first, and then we're going to look at, you know, our continued <laughs> heat spells that we're going to continue to get. But we can, at least in the burns bog data, uh, pick it up quite well. We see a drop in net CO2 uptake, and we see an enhancement in methane. And so we're still trying to tease out and look at that data a little bit more in detail and to see sort of the persistence of that. Um, but there's definitely a marked difference in the fluxes before, during, and after, and we're going to keep working on that because so I think that's a really interesting question and something we're going to continue to experience. Fascinating. Thanks. Thank you. If no one else, Sarah, I have a question, Sarah. Yeah. Um, one is just, how, can you talk a little bit about the any general debates going on on the sort of verifiability of uh, wetlands as, um, you know, as carbon solutions? Is that a big debate? Is that a difficult thing to do? Is it pretty straightforward? In terms of <laughs> as, yeah, no, great question. Um, it's definitely not an easy thing to do. I think any of us working with natural systems, um, 
know just how complex they are to try to predict and forecast. But there is, I think, you know, there is a lot of work going in to, to help better quantify these fluxes and model these fluxes and develop tools for these different, you know, methodologies. There are a number, there are already a number of different methodologies out there for, um, you know, including wetlands and carbon markets. Mm -hmm. I, I think with everything, there is some uncertainty. Um, with wetlands, I like to think of it as sort of carbon being just one, one part of the puzzle of, you know, the benefits of restoring mm -hmm. and preserving these ecosystems. Um, and generally it tends to be better than the alternative. So even if we're not getting maybe the exact number, because <laughs> that can be quite difficult, sure. I would say there's probably a good chance that there's overall a positive benefit. Um, and we're also providing a number of other co-benefits. Mm -hmm. But yes, that is something. And we, but there is more work going on and we just got some recent funding to do this across Canada um, and compare data and develop models. So hopefully we can better refine some of those estimates and make it more user-friendly and that kind of stuff. Great, thanks, thanks very much. Thanks. I see that Andrew Black has his hand up, I think. And uh, yeah. there's one in the chat. Yes, um, great talk, uh, Sarah. Um, I had a question about the, the interesting result of the difference in temperature between the active and passive sites at Burns Bog, uh, and the fact that it was w warmer on the active, right? I, I was wondering, how does that relate to the energy balance, and what what was the difference in evapotranspiration between between the two sites? Could you comment on that? Uh, yes, I think I have some slides back here that I could get to. Um, wasn't sure I was going to have time. Andy, I think yeah. Um, so one of the key differences. So if we look at the differences in the radiation balance between the two sites, we can see that the um, active site, because it has a lower albedo, has slightly greater net radiation, but that because the passive site has greater aerodynamic resistance, um, oh, sorry, greater aerodynamic conductance, we can see that the partitioning of sensible and latent heat between the two sites is relatively similar. So if we look at Daytime temperatures, they're roughly similar between the two sites, but it's really when we consider these nighttime temperatures that we see the biggest differences. And this is what's leading to those differences um, over, uh, over the longer time scale. So the daily and monthly and seasonal scales. Uh, and also we did you know, some very simple box modeling here. And we saw that you know, the active site, the wetter site was also had higher mixed layer air temperature than the passive site as well. Yeah, that, that's, that's great. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks, Andy. And then question in the chat. Okay, from Emily Brown. Um, Question about the peatland sites in the photos of the actively restored site looked much greener, um, but I was a bit surprised at first glance that it had lower photosynthesis. I'm wondering um, if you have ideas where the differences in photosynthesis come in. Uh, yeah, yeah, nice question. Um, so uh, here at our passively restored site, we have it does look a little bit greener here. Um, this is actually pretty green, but we see it's maybe not taken at the peak of the growing season the way this is. But here we have uh, some taller vegetation. Some we have shrubs, um, scrub pine. So we have slightly higher photosynthesis relative to some of the sphag. Here we have more sphagnum dominated that tends to have slightly lower photosynthesis uh, and sedges. But we see, you know, from yeah, from these more sort of vascular plants here, um, and you know, shrubs and 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 pines, we tend to see higher higher rates of photosynthesis at the drier site. Great, thanks. Uh, and I see a question from Yannick. Yeah, hey, hey, sir. Thank you for your presentation. My my question, I have actually two questions. So one question is that. As I know, the serenity is not only affect the green, uh, the NE, but also affect 
the methane emission. So I wonder changes in serenity can how it affect the methane emission and in terms of uh, greenhouse equivalent, CO2 equivalent budget. And also the second question is that, uh, do you think this finding in California can be generalized to any region on the world? For example, drought can affect the methane emission and the, any change in blue carbon side would be interesting to generalize. So yeah, I, I wonder your thought on that. Yeah, great, thanks for that. Um, yeah, so let me come back to this slide here. So we saw large differences in net CO2 exchange, but we saw very little differences in methane. So methane at the site is really quite low. Um, and I think, you know, I don't think the, I think it's sort of salty enough or yeah, sort of the, there's very little methane anyway. So if it becomes saltier, you're not gonna see less methane because it's already sort of um, a low methane emitting site as it is. Um, it will be interesting. I think different sites might behave differently. And this site, right, we only have the net flux measurements. We don't really have sort of the, the biogeochemistry of what's going on in the marsh sediment. Um, so even though it's a brackish marsh, we see very little methane being emitted, but sort of what's going on there, is that because of, you know, sulfate um, or, you know, what are sort of the different microbial communities there? I, you know, here at our Richmond site, we actually see, even though it's sort of comparable in terms of average salinity, we see higher methane fluxes. So I don't think every site's going to behave the same. And that's one of the big data get, or one of the big gaps that we have in terms of methane emissions from blue carbon sites is what is the methane emissions across different salinity regimes? Um, and what are the drivers of that? So there's a lot of scatter and there's a lot of uh, uncertainty in terms of methane emissions across these different salinity gradients. And so that's what sort of motivated some of our work here um, in BC. Um, but yes, other sites have seen impacts of droughts on productivity in the marshes, similar to what we saw as well. So I think, again, it might depend a little bit, you know, on the, the baseline salinity levels at your site, but you know, for this brackish marsh and probably others, we do see impacts of droughts on them. Another question. Josephine has a question. <laughs> Yes, I have a, a pretty basic question. The The only time that I think about wetlands is within uh, like agricultural lands. And so I'm guessing it's a very different type of wetlands, perhaps because it's both managed at a very different type of scale. And so I'm, I'm wondering like, what's the, what's the scale of the wetlands that you're looking at? And is there something, it, should I think about like management versus scale being, being one of the more key source of, of differences for this kind of, of system? Yeah, a nice question. Um, I think that the the size, I think the location in the broader landscape is more important than the actual size of the wetlands. Um, so for example, we've been doing, you know, so if you have like a, uh, I don't know, a natural small wetland versus a natural large wetland, you know, they might behave, like they have similar types of vegetation and water levels. They might have similar rates of carbon uptake per meter squared. and you know, similar levels of methane. We're doing some nice work with some folks uh, in Manitoba. So we've been partnering with Ducks Unlimited Canada out in Manitoba, and we're looking at wetland fluxes from wetlands embedded sort of in the prairie pothole region. So they're embedded in agricultural landscapes. And one of the biggest drivers that we're seeing is the difference in runoff from the agricultural lands. Um, and so we've been making measurements at two different marshes and they look very similar. They're both sort of dominated by emergent vegetation. Um, but one has much higher uh, sulfate and much lower phosphate than the other based just on sort of agricultural runoff and inputs from the, the broader landscape. And so we see vastly different methane emissions between the two. Um, and I would have expected, you know, if it was a natural marsh that both would be large methane sources, but we see one site has virtually no methane and one site has sort of the amount that we would, you know, would have guessed. Um, and that's all due to the differences in water quality based on their position in the landscape and their location and the surrounding land use types. Oh, thank you, this is really interesting. Yeah. 
Andy, did you have another question? Or was that? Oh, sorry, you're still muted. Still muted. Sorry about that. Um, yes, you and your colleagues have made tremendous headway on the the global um, methane network. That's quite impressive. Um, perhaps you could bring that slide up again. Uh, yep. If you wouldn't mind. Um, and you mentioned in your talk that probably the, the biggest gaps are really in the tropical area. Is, is, that, is that right? And does that, does that mean there's a lot of heterogeneity in the sites in, in tropical areas? In other words, it's difficult to generalize what, what those emissions are likely to be. Yeah, so one of the things that we've, so if you look at, um, you know, top down estimates of wetland methane, you know, about 60% originates from the tropics. But it seems like the tower data that we have, I, maybe, you know, based on sort of the sites that were selected tend to under, vastly underestimate methane emissions from these wetlands. So, you know, one of the things that like, we don't have very many sites with methane sort of over, you know, the Amazon forest, right? It's difficult to sort of make these measurements in these types of ecosystems. So I think we're just not sampling what are some of the key sources. Um, and so there is more and more work that's, you know, starting up. We just don't have it in the database yet. But, you know, we're working with some folks across Peru and in Brazil uh, and elsewhere to try to bring in more of these types of measurements and hopefully you know, catch these higher methane emitting wetlands um, that are being picked up, you know, and sort of these, these inversions, these atmospheric inversions. Great, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Last questions from the audience. Well, if we were in the BD Biodiversity Museum, we would be being chased out at this very minute. <laughs> so uh, in the spirit of that lecture hall and uh, yeah, just a great closing talk for the seminar series this semester, Sarah, that was really great. Um, thank you ever so much. And I hope all the IRS students aren't over knocking on your door after this, but uh, yeah, let me just join others and a warm thank you for, for that talk. Thanks again for the invitation and good luck oh, with the end of welcome. term. <laughs> yeah, to everyone on that. Thank you all. Thanks again.